You may please start now. Uh, okay, should I just start speaking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to one of the IIC's Diamond Jubilee celebrations that we're holding in 2022. Um, as some of you might know, the India International Center is celebrating the Diamond Jubilee year of its foundation, and it was inaugurated in 1962. So to commemorate this occasion, we are holding uh, celebrations in um, you know, various forms, lots of programs through the year. We are, um, with the committee, um, we have six cluster groups actually, which have decided to hold programs in six, six different subject areas. Uh, one of them is uh, digital governance. Uh, which is hosting the discussion this evening. Uh, so I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to introduce to all of you and to invite uh, with uh, to the IIC, Dr. Richard Hayton. He is the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Information and Security Officer of Trustnomics. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about a really exciting subject, which is the Internet of Things and the future, um, you know, the promise and the perils and how governments are looking to regulate it. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Hayton in a minute. But during the course of his presentation, if you look down at your Zoom screens, uh, you have a little box called the Q&A box. So as questions come to you, just drop them in the Q&A box. And once his lecture finishes, uh, we'll be picking up those questions and posing them uh, to him. So, um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Hayton, to take it away. Thank you. Let's try the hard bit, which is uh, get the technology to work. So hopefully I can share my screen. Are you seeing my screen okay? Yes, we can. Perfect, then I will begin. So hello and thank you uh, for inviting me to do this talk. And today I'm gonna to talk about IoT security and, and some of the complexity behind it. Uh, I'm a technologist, but I'm gonna try and keep this uh, reasonably high level, reasonably light to explain how it affects our lives rather than some of the technical details. So I'll touch on some of the complexity and give some examples of uh, why this is such a complicated area uh, and why it's, uh, why it's so interesting. So if I can persuade the slide to change, there we go. So the first question is, is why we're doing this at all. What do we want from IoT security? Uh, and the most important thing to remember is that we're doing this for a reason. We want to leverage the new technology. It would be very easy to make a secure IoT device. You just don't plug it into the electricity supply. Uh, just like a car, the, the, the safest car is one that won't go along the road. The safest IoT device is one that doesn't do anything. But that isn't very interesting. So we want to leverage the technology. So everything we do for security is going to be a compromise. It's going to be get the most out of the technology, but at the same time, protecting individual users, consumers, uh, but also, and I'm gonna talk a lot in this talk about infrastructure and broader society. It's not just individuals who are impacted when IoT security goes wrong. It can be um, whole economies um, or communities. So we need to protect both of these while leveraging the technology. I'm gonna talk a little bit about where, what's working today, where the regulation is, is doing a good job, uh, but also um, areas where this is the market's failing. So industry is not solving it itself and maybe regulation is needed. Um, regulation has an impact. It sometimes has a negative impact. So what should it do? And I'll talk a little bit about good regulation and bad regulation for IoT and, and why it's a, both a tricky topic, but, but whether some clear ways forward. Before I do a little bit about the company I work for, I work for a company called Trustonic. Um, we've been around for ooh, about eight years now, something like that. And we build a very deep security product. We build a, a piece called a trusted execution environment. It's a piece of software that runs on mobile phones and IoT devices and vehicles. And it's responsible for securing parts of those devices. So doing things like enabling payment or enabling secure video playback and lots of other things. I'm not going to talk about our product today. Uh, but just to give you the background of, of sort of where I'm coming from, um, our technology is on about 2 billion devices around the world. Most of these are mobile phones. You've probably got it on your mobile phone. You don't even know it's there. Uh, we're also in a lot of vehicles, though. Increasingly, vehicles are becoming larger and larger IoT devices, and security for them is, is very, very important. And this has become a huge area of interest in the last few years. Maybe five years ago, um, we were just working mainly on mobile phones. 
Today, we've got 70 million vehicles under contract, and, and this is now it's growing rapidly for us. The way we work is we work very closely with the people who built the chips. So Samsung, Renaissance, NXP, MediaTek, and the like, they build the chips that go into these devices, uh, but they don't typically buy from us. They're just our partners. And then the bigger ecosystem buy, buys our products and, and has to work together to give a secure solution. And to enable that, there's a number of standard bodies involved. So there's a, a bunch of logos around the bottom of this slide, but there's a number of different standards organizations who are struggling to standardize and protect different parts of the industry. Some are doing very well and have narrow, clearly defined remit. EMV Co deals with payment cards and, and bit cards and does a very good job of it. Common criteria and is a much broader uh, approach to marking things as being high quality. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that relates to IoT. To talk a little bit about myself before I get into the, the meat of the presentation, uh, I'm the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Trustonic. Um, so I'm responsible for a lot of where we go next. Uh, I'm also chair of the TE Committee at Global Platform. Global Platform is an industry body that looks after our particular bit of technology that's used in IoT devices. And I'm responsible for one area of that, the trusted execution environments. I'm also an innovator at ARM, that's a, 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 an industry program they run. And previously I worked for Citrix Zen Mobile. Um, Citrix was more responsible for enterprise products. So my background is more in enterprise products. Now I'm much more involved in products that the whole of society uses. And back in the mists of time, long, long ago, um, I did a PhD uh, it, um, in security at Cambridge University. I'm still based in Cambridge. I'm, I've, I've moved a mere 10 miles from where, from where I started long ago. So let's talk a little bit about IoT. So first question is, what is IoT? And there are different people who have different definitions. The definition I'm going to use is very broad. It's really anything that can be connected to the internet. And it's pretty much everything these days. So we often think about IoT in terms of personal gadgets, in terms of phones and watches and Alexas and so on, but street lights, barcode scanners, cars, washing machines, electricity meters, solar panels, all of these things have been collected, uh, are connected today and are used for numerous different things. For some of these devices, connectivity is their primary purpose. You know, an Alexa device, for example, or a Google Home as a device works because it's connected. That's what it's for. But your washing machine may simply have some technology in it which monitors the health of the motor and reports back to the manufacturer periodically. Um, you get those in some high-end washing machines today, but they're in all industrial turbines. Uh, they're in wind uh, turbines and so on. So this technology is bubbling down towards the consumer, but that, that connectivity, that ability to manage or monitor remotely is becoming ubiquitous and it's in everything. And I would sort of view IoT as a 21st century equivalent of electricity. When electricity was invented, people talked about light bulbs. But wind forward 100 years and everything's got electricity of it, one sort or another. And IoT is similar. Connectivity enables an awful lot of new solutions, but it also creates a lot of security problems as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those problems and also some of those solutions today. So I want to talk a little bit about what can happen in an IoT attack. But maybe before I do that, I should talk a little bit about why people attack IoT devices. And there's typically two reasons. The first one is financial, because there's money to be made. If I can commit a fraud of some description or a ransomware attack or something else and get money, then I might be motivated uh, to force an attack uh, and, to, and to make your device misbehave. That's the biggest reason. Uh, the other reason, which is also important, is terrorism or activism related. Um, and a lot of people, will want to just cause mischief for less serious or more serious reasons. And both of these are the big reasons why attacks happen. But in terms of what happens, I'm gonna split and I'm gonna talk about five different categories and give examples from each. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's important to realize the different sorts of things you need to protect against. Because otherwise you go in with a heavy handed legislation and you solve one problem, but you leave the others open. I, I describe this as a sort of you know, putting bars on the door, but leaving the window open. It, it doesn't work as an approach because the attackers will always find a way around. So I'm going to give five examples of IoT security problems in these five different areas. 
So the first one of these is data abuse. Um, so we know IoT devices have a lot of our data. An awful lot is written about how our personal data may be used. And I'm not going to really talk about personal data because I don't really consider that as, um, I think that's well covered by personal legislation. I'm going to talk about data which is used in devices, data which doesn't belong to me, but which is still of value and can still be abused. And the difficulty is if you have data that you have legitimate, useful purposes for, there's almost always an illegitimate use for that data. Somebody can take that data and use it for things you didn't intend for it to be used for. The example on this slide was where the plans of a secret military base were disclosed to the general public. And that was a big security breach. But the way that it happened was simply people using fitness apps. So people running around uh, a, military, a US military base wearing their Fitbits or equivalent trackers were unwittingly giving away the location of the different paths and staircases within that base. It's a really interesting problem because that data in itself was not of any great value, but in aggregate, it provided information which was to the detriment of the US military. It wasn't to the detriment of the individuals who were giving up that data. It wasn't to the detriment of the people who built the fitness trackers, but society as a whole was suffering because of the aggregation of that data. And one of the things I'm gonna talk quite a lot about today is scale. It's not about one fitness tracker tracking one individual, that's got its own problems, but it's about how that data in aggregate could be abused. It's really difficult to legislate about that. It's really difficult to think about it, but it's a major problem. The next section I'm gonna talk about is denial of service. And really there's two different problems here. And again, I'm gonna focus on IoT examples. So often when we hear about denial of service, it is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a way that an attacker stops a system from working. They might do that maliciously. They might do that for financial gain. One of the most uh, well understood types of denial of service is called distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks. And these are effectively the equivalent of getting every, all, of, all of your friends to ring a number at the same time. Overload somebody's switchboard, they can't, get, they can't do their normal job. Now, in the old days, that used to be done by, by attackers getting lots and lots of computers and all connecting to the same website to try and take it down. But these days, there are many more IoT devices than there are computers. So if I can get 100,000 IoT devices to call that website, then I can do the same job. So even though the IoT device itself might be something entirely mundane, um, maybe it's um, you know, a water quality meter. If there's 100,000 of those and I can get them all to contact um, a particular government website at the same time of day, it'll overload that website and I've done an attack on that website. And again, the problem with the IoT device in that case is nothing to do with the individual device, but the impact is significant. It's easy to forget there are also denial of service attacks, which are just about the IoT endpoints itself. The colonial pipeline attack in 2021 was a really clear example of this. A denial of service attack was done uh, for ransomware. So in other words, the attackers demanded money to undo it. Well, essentially, they stopped the, the pipeline from running. The pipeline contained hundreds of IoT sensors and actuators. And by overrunning those with malware, the attackers stopped the pipeline from running. And this was considered a US national security threat. A state of emergency was declared because it had a, a, a major impact uh, on the US economy. And again, the attackers were just after money, but the impact of that attack was much larger. So to prevent these attacks, the devices need to be more secure. They need to be secure against remote attacks. That's the most important. That's where somebody dials up over the internet and attacks them. They must be secure against hardware attacks if somebody can go in and physically tamper with the devices. But also importantly is administrative attacks. Almost all of the big attacks that hit the headline are down to bad administrative control. So in other words, people having bad passwords for things or people, um, you know, a company that's so updating software, not doing a good job of managing which version of the software gets sent out to all of their customers. So quite often it comes down to the human error or the, the human who was fooled by the attacker rather than something in the deep in the software. And as with all security, you know, humans are often the weakest link. Moving on to a couple of others, um, device theft 
Obviously, things get stolen. There's nothing specific about IoT about that. But one of the things that happens in IoT is if an attacker steals some devices to get something relatively cheap from them, then they can take down entire cities. So an example here from 2011, where attackers stole a set of SIM cards from traffic lights. The attackers weren't interested in the traffic lights. All they were interested in was the SIM cards which were just little phone cards, and they probably got $5 for each one of those they stole. But they caused hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage because all of them had to be replaced, and obviously the city was without traffic lights. Now, the important example here is, although you can look at this as just a theft and say, well, theft happens and you need to protect against it, because these are connected devices, because SIM cards by their nature are connecting to the network, to the cloud, Technically, we can prevent those thefts by simply making them not work. It's entirely possible to mark those 100, 400 SIM cards that were stolen as no longer usable. And that means that an attacker is not motivated to do this in future. So this is where connectivity can start to offer solutions as well as causing problems. If, the, if there's no point in the attacker stealing these because the things that they steal have no value, they're not motivated to do the attack. And that's, again, is something we can do many times over. Um, there's lots of solutions we can do there for IoT security. Let's talk a little bit about device fakery. Um, there's device, there's fake goods in all areas um, of commerce, but IoT fakery is often relatively straightforward because the devices are often relatively mundane. So you can get, fakery such as the top one on this slide, which is an external hard drive. It, it looks like it's a terabyte external drive and you plug it in and it works. You can save data to it, you can load data from it. But if you prize the lid off, you find that actually it's an empty box and it's not very clear on this slide, but essentially that's a small USB stick and a couple of big heavy, heavy metal nuts to make up. So it's a, probably a $5 device, which is pretending to be a $100 device. Not very sophisticated, but attackers will want to do that. The example in the middle is at the other extreme. It's extremely sophisticated. This is a fake iPhone 12. It's a very cheap version of an iPhone 12. It's not running the right software. It appears to have three cameras, but actually two of them are fake. The battery is very low capacity. The chips are very low quality. But outwardly, it looks like an iPhone 12, and consumers can be fooled. But at the bottom is really the one which is, which is most scary. This is an example of a fake microchip. So as you can see from those four chips on the row, one of them is not like the others. And it may outwardly do roughly the same, but it's a cheaper version of the chip, which may have, um, it may not work in the same way. And that can lead to all sorts of problems because now if you get fake devices in your supply chain, you may not know about it. The that chip might be worth a dollar, but if that chip becomes central to the autonomous driving system uh, of a vehicle, it could cause hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage or loss of life. If that's an aircraft part, you can see the problems that this could happen. So whereas fakery will happen everywhere, fakery in electronic devices is particularly scary because outwardly things look entirely normal. But again, for IoT devices that are connected to the internet, we have technical solutions where we can look into that microchip and ask it to say, are you genuine or not? And I'll talk a little bit about how that works. But essentially we have technical solutions precisely because the microchip is connected to the internet. So it can effectively do the equivalent of showing its identity card and prove that it is who it should be. There are technologies that we have available to us that allow us to tackle some of these problems. And finally, just on this list of possible problems, I wanna talk about probably the biggest problem, which is fake data. Our society today runs on data. There is all sorts of different data and it's used for all different purposes. And remember, criminals are essentially typically after financial gain or terrorism related gains. And they can generate fake data much as others may generate fake news and it can be just as impactful. So the implications can be huge. It's a really, really important problem but it's not talked about very much. And I can, if I can fake data from sensors, I can manipulate markets to give financial good. 
I can crash systems which shouldn't work. I can break air traffic control or stop the lights from the city from working. But I can do other things as well. I can justify unpopular decisions. I can explain why a coronavirus lockdown is a good idea or a bad idea based on fake data. And if people don't trust the data, they won't trust the government. So getting on top of fake data is really important. It's a very broad problem, but there are a number of technical solutions that IoT can bring. Again, because devices are connected, they have the ability to prove who is saying what, when. And that proof of which device said what, gave what information at what time, that gives us a basis for trust. So just to summarize sort of that sort of first section of the talk, there's a whole bunch of different ways that IoT uh, attacks can, can abuse things. And sometimes the person impacted is the individual, in which case we can rely on a lot of uh, legislation focused on individuals and individuals' ability to buy from company A or company B. Um, you know, the market will control that reasonably well. Equally, if it's an enterprise that's impacted because their secrets are stolen uh, or because their service is impacted, then they're motivated to fix that. If it's a retail device and you know, fake, fake devices have been created, the retail channel is, is again motivated to fix that. So sometimes there's good alignment. But in all of the examples I've given today, there are impacts for the broader society. And those, that broader society impacts are not going to be solved because the individual chooses to buy from a different company um, or the enterprise buys a firewall or something else. There are problems for the broader society where really there is a strong argument that some, le some regulation is required um, to solve these problems. Now, regulation is hard, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what people are doing in regulation and, and what's working and, and, and why sometimes it's very hard. And it is always a balance. Sometimes the market can decide. The customer will choose to pay for security or not. But in my experience, customers can't generally make informed decisions in most markets, and they won't generally act in the broad society's interest. So what individual consumers do may be fine for them, but they may uh, end up with society not actually getting the benefits that they need. There's also a danger that individual OEMs, device manufacturers, really claim to have better security than they have. You know, they put pictures of, of padlocks on their packaging and five-star security, but it doesn't mean anything if there's, no, if there's no measure to say how that was tested and how it was checked. And if the consumer doesn't know what to look for, then how will the OEMs be held to account? On the other hand, you can go for an, a more of an invention, interventionist approach where security is mandated by a government or industry body. And this has happened in the past, particularly in some areas, um, like payment cards. Um, typically, there an expert group decides what good enough security is, and, uh, and that's, that's your basis. And it can work quite well, but it is open to scope and solution bias. And what I mean by that is, if I'm sitting on a standards body to work out the best way to do a, a type of security, I'm motivated to promote the solution that's in my company's best interest, and, and other colleagues uh, are, are, are interested to promote theirs. So you can end up with a standard which bakes in a particular type of solution, and that adds cost to the manufacturers, and it risks innovation because now, now you've mandated, you've got to solve the problem in a particular way. Other better ways may never be, never be found. So it's always a balance. But around the world, there has been a lot of, of recent cyber regulation, and this is a chart from a cybersecurity um, a consultancy firm, which just shows some of the different cybersecurity initiatives around the world focused specifically on IoT. Um, generally speaking, these are good things. The, in, the intentions are definitely there, but the benefits vary somewhat between the different schemes. And, and one of the criticisms you get from, from global companies is it makes it very expensive to work on a global standard. If I build an IoT device and I want to sell into all of those countries which now have regulations, I have to regulate in each of the different companies. And some of, that means I've got a whole bunch of different schemes and a whole bunch of inconsistency. So there is a bit of an argument to go towards global legislation, but at the same time, this is very early and, and different markets are looking to do different things. It's also worth saying that IoT here, again, is different, it's defined differently in the different schemes. 
And one of the difficulties is a lot of the focus is often on consumer gadgets. So things that I buy as an individual, whereas as I've just shown in a lot of the examples, a lot of the problems aren't with consumer products at all. They are with IoT used in pipelines or traffic lights or other large systems. So it's a good start, but there's a long way to go here. And I'm afraid, you know, the problems don't stop there. Stop there. One of the difficulties here is complexity. So IoT devices we think of as hardware, but really they're primarily about software. So an IoT device runs a lot of different pieces of software on top of it, even a simple one. And a lot of the IoT regulation today is focusing on some basic hygiene, as it's called, things you should do to keep that software, uh, to make sure that software is good. The two criteria that almost all of these schemes are adopting is one, that the device should be secure by default. That essentially means it doesn't have a default password. Uh, it doesn't, you don't buy it in a state where it's insecure and therefore open to attack, but you buy it in a state where it's secure. That's a really good idea. The other principle that, that's used very commonly is that software should be kept up to date. Now we all see on our phones and everything else, this constant push for, for software updates. And the reason for that is that if a problem is found, because all of these devices are connected, once the bad guys know about the problem, they can start to abuse it. So it's important that once somebody discovers a problem in security, that it's fixed as quickly as possible. It's a good intent intention. But the picture on the right sort of shows you the level of complexity. This is a beautiful picture that I, I love because it looks like a galaxy. It's actually not a galaxy. What this is, is this is a, a diagram illustrating the software complexity inside the Linux operating system. Linux is uh, a computer operating system which is present in many IoT devices. You'll find it inside, it's underneath Android. Um, so you'll find it in mobile phones, you'll find it in webcams, you'll find it in desktop computers, you'll find it in traffic lights. And each one of those little dots that looks like a star on that, on that diagram represents a piece of software. And each bit of software is written by somebody else. They're written by different teams and the lines show dependencies between those software. So what this diagram is showing is that when one piece of software in the middle had a problem in it, all of those other pieces of software were impacted. And this is a, a visualization from a tool which is trying to help people get their, get their brain around that to work out what has to change because one piece of software was found to be vulnerable. And really all I want you to take away from this slide is it's really, really complicated. But let me show you a simpler version of this. This is an example of an IoT product. It's mainly software. At the very bottom, the table, if you like, is some pretty standard chips and, and hardware that the device runs on. And on top of that is a stack of software. The board support package is built by the chip maker, by Qualcomm or Samsung or whoever. There's then software libraries, uh, um, such as um, pieces such as Linux, as I was just talking about, software that we produce and others produce. And then at the top, there is what's called the OEM embedded application. This is the thing that makes the IoT device into a fitness tracker or into a doorbell or whatever it may be. And then there may be some apps installed on top if it's a cell phone. And you can think of it as a big pile of software sitting on top of each other. The critical thing from, an op, uh, from a perspective of managing this is that most of this software comes with no warranty whatsoever. That is to say, somebody wrote this software and out of the goodness of their heart, they made it available to others to use. It's called open source software. So I might write a library which say, let's say it can recognize cats. You know, it's a little piece of technology that I invented for whatever purposes, maybe I was building a cat flap and it, it uses some data from a camera and it detects the cat. And I say, this is great, I'm gonna use it, but I'm gonna let others use it as well. So I make it available and somebody else takes that and puts it onto their pile uh, of software and builds an application over the top. Now, I'm not promising the software is gonna work. I'm just saying you can have it if you want it, but it's up to you. And that's what happens with almost all software. So in the end, you end up with this huge stack of software that nobody promises will work, and the device maker has assembled this stack, really has a problem. Typically, they cross their fingers and hope. 
or they have a nice big disclaimer on the product which says, warning, this stack of bricks may fall over. And we're all used to those click-through agreements you get whenever you start any sort of website or IoT device. So customers really don't understand the difficulty here. And, but that's sort of the situation. It's a very complicated pile of bricks. When you get to software update, I think this, this diagram illustrates exactly what happens. One of these bits of software needs to change. There was a security bug in it, and it's important that it gets fixed because if it doesn't get fixed, the bad guys will be able to use that to, to make, the, uh, make the whole pile fall over. The problem is when I change that one bit of software, any of the pieces of software that rely on it might, might, be, might be affected in, an, in a negative way. So we all see this when we update software on our phone and it gets a bit slower than it used to be. Um, and that's a general problem is that the software changes and somebody really ought to check that there's no bad impacts. But it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do that because of the sheer complexity and the fact that the person who sold me a fitness tracker for not very much money at all doesn't have hundreds and thousands of hundreds of people to check hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So it's a very complicated situation. Software update sounds and is a really good idea, but the implications are vast. So what do we do? It is complicated, um, but it is something which is being tackled and it's being tackled quite well. There's one industry in particular that really has taken this problem head on, and that's automotive. So in automotive, there is a standard, uh, not very sexily named WP29, Work Package 29, which is new cybersecurity regulation, which has come in over the last few years. And the most important thing about this regulation is not that it has clever technical solutions to all of these problems, but that it says who is responsible for solving them. It says the vehicle maker, the OEM as it's called technically, is responsible for the cybersecurity of the vehicle throughout its lifetime not on day one when you buy it from the shop, but for the next 20 years while it's still on the road. And they are responsible both for the security in terms of managing risks and so on, but the software update. So what this legislation has done, and it has taken many years uh, to come into this, India uh, incidentally is a, um, it's a participant, an observer participant, and has been for the last, since 2003. So this has been a long time coming, this piece of legislation. But what this legislation does is it forces the issue and it makes it the OEM's responsibility. We work, uh, we've worked with automotive for many years. And what we found is that now cybersecurity is a top conversation with vehicle makers. Five years ago, they weren't interested. Today, it's every conversation we have is about cybersecurity. And that's really positive. That's driving the right sort of change. So this sort of um, legislative change has been very powerful. And I think it can apply in other parts of IoT. Part of the importance about how this legislation works in WP29, but other legislation as well, is moving from prescriptive focus, which says here are technical solutions to how to solve things. So things like EMV code, uh, in payment card said, you must have a secure element. So one of those little digital chips you see on a credit card, you must use one of those. And people like PSTI, the UK PSTI, which is secure, the, the UK um, IoT legislation is saying things like, you must not ship with a default password. So they're very specific things you must do or not do. What this is moving to now is a process uh, legislation, which is more focused on responsibility. So WP29 says, the vehicle OEM is responsible for cybersecurity. They don't say how they should do it, but they say they are responsible. So they point the finger at the people who need to solve the problem rather than saying exactly how they must solve it. And in terms of the amount of effort that should be put in, this, this, this new term called attack value focused um, legislation, bit of a mouthful. But what it really means is that it says how hard an attacker has to try to overcome security. So if Effectively, they may say, for this particular area, it must take an, an attacker at least a month to defeat it, because we reckon it's not worth them spending a month doing it, so that's okay. The great thing about that approach is, as technology changes and attackers get better at one particular approach, um, it means that devices have to get more secure. 
because what used to take a month now only takes a day. But it means that the legislation automatically follows whatever the, the, the weakest part of the solution is, rather than you know, mandating a particular technology which may prove to be good or bad. So to sort of go, you know, to summarize this a little bit, IoT is immensely complicated. If you think about an IoT device and what keeps it in the air, you know, that little drone in the corner, you can focus down on the details, you can focus on the individual device, you can focus on the software stacks, and you can worry about all of the complexity of making that thing work. And that is important, but that's not the important part for legislators to think about. The real risk is about scale. It's not about what one IoT device can do, it's what a billion of them can do. If I can attack, if I can get data from your fitness tracker or change the value of you know, your electricity meter or change the, the speed of, uh, you know, read the speed of your car, I might be able to do a bad thing. But if I can do that citywide or countrywide, that's when you have real risk. So the important word that IoT security researchers talk about is scalability. Scalable attacks are what we care about. And because these devices are all connected, if I know how to break one of them, I can break another one which is running the same software. So once I have an attack on one drone, I can attack a thousand drones or a million drones. If I can find a way, because it's of its connectivity of unlocking your car, I can unlock every car of the same make. So scalable attacks are really what you need to concern about. So for example, setting off every fire alarm in the city, setting every traffic light to green, these are the things that have massive impact rather than just a single device, which is about a nuisance. So scalability is, is, is the problem, but connectivity can be some of the solution. And really, I think there's two areas uh, that we need to focus on. The first of these is trust. Because of connectivity, we have the ability to tell the difference between a genuine and a fake device, between real data and fake data, good actors and rogue actors. That ability to trust devices gives us a huge differentiator uh, where IoT can be tackled, IoT problems can be tackled in a way which doesn't apply in other industries. The other area we need to think about is resilience. Things will go wrong, devices will be attacked. Um, there will be faults, there will be software attacks and so on, but when things go wrong, we have to think about what should happen. Uh, we can't just throw the towel in, you have to think about degradation. If something goes wrong in a plane, it doesn't fall out the sky. It's got to think about how to land safely. And the same goes for IoT. In terms of trust, it's all about data and trust in that data. If you take an example of a very low cost IoT device, it might be a, giving you the humidity or soil quality, uh, quality in agro farming. So for agro IoT, we deploy huge numbers of sensors to detect how well crops are growing so the farmer knows where, it can go, where to go and water, where to, where to tend the crops, where to leave them alone. But if I can fake that data, I can manipulate the stock market. I can generate huge amounts of money for myself as a bad actor, but do huge harm to society. However, if we can trust that data, if we can ignore data from fake sensors and, and ignore data that attackers put in, then we have a basis for, for secure IoT. And it's actually very easy to do. We have the technology to do this today. So achieving trust for connected devices is relatively straightforward because those devices can be given cryptographic identities, but essentially they're given identity cards. Think of them as fingerprints for each device. We can track which devices are manufactured in a factory, which devices are updated with software, which devices were given to a particular farmer or put in a particular field. And that allows us to make decisions about trust. Should we trust the data that comes from that device? So risk assessment can be done in a strong way. You know, IoT was originally about connectivity, about connecting all of these devices to the internet. Um, and much like web browsers, they're all anonymous. But we have the technology and, and some people are starting to do this to make those devices trustworthy. So making IoT 2.0 about trust 
enables all of these billions of devices to be used for good and makes it very difficult for them to be used for harm. So trust to me is the most important thing to get right in IoT. And legislation, in my view, should be focusing on ensuring that devices are trustworthy rather than about necessarily about whether they can be hacked or not. The second piece is resilience. And resilience is about thinking about what happens when a device is attacked and what should happen. And to give you an example of what should happen, let's imagine I have an IoT lock. So this is a lock that I can remotely lock and unlock. Now, it will get attacked, but what should happen when it's attacked? If that lock was in a hospital and something went wrong, maybe a fire, I'd like all of the locks to unlock so that everybody can get out. However, if that lock was in a, in a prison and something goes wrong, I'd rather all the locks stayed locked. Because from a risk perspective, I'd rather it's safer to keep the doors locked than it is to keep them all open. So thinking about what should happen when things go wrong is really important. And it's something that we tend to be very bad at doing. Resilience can be achieved in a number of ways. The, the, the first piece is isolation. It's focusing on what needs to be secure and, and making that secure and not worrying about the rest of the software. So an IoT device may do a thousand things and only one of them is, is important for security. Uh, a good example here I often use is an insulin pump. I can have an IoT insulin pump, which regularly gives a patient a dose of insulin, um, but it's also got flashing lights and network connectivity and all sorts of other gizmos. They don't matter for security, but the actual piece that administers the pump, that really does matter. That's the piece that has to be isolated and secured. And technology, um, such as what Trustonic does, can be very good at, at, at isolating that security and making it important. You also smartness is important, and that doesn't necessarily mean AI, but simply IoT devices shouldn't be dumb and unquestioned. To take that insulin pump example, if it's asked to administer a dose, it should always say, is that a reasonable dose? If you've asked me to administer a thousand times a normal dose, maybe it shouldn't do it. That was probably an attack or an error. So putting some questioning into the devices rather than having them as dumb devices is, is very important so that errors don't get magnified and, and attackers can't use errors to make things worse. And then global resilience is really about avoiding a single point of control. If you imagine a motorway, if all of those cars are driven individually, whether by humans or computers, then any problem that impacts one is less likely to impact the others. If they're all connected to one big eye in the sky and that eye in the sky goes wrong, then you've got a disaster on your hands. So single point of failure is a bad idea. And single point of control is, is just another way of saying single point of control failure. So in summary, IoT really is the new electricity. It is everywhere. There are more IoT devices than you are aware of today, and they will just increase. Because today, it is cheaper to put a computer in a car than it is to put a wire. Um, a modern car now has it saves you know, kilograms of weight by having less wire and lots more computers. So typically, they have a few hundred computers in them rather than a few hundred wires. And that's just the way the world is going. So IoT will be everywhere. But we must think about security in those same terms. Security is always about scale. It isn't about what one IoT device can do. It's about what a large number can do, for good or for bad. And that makes the problems very broad. Uh, in my view, regulation should focus on trust and resilience as the two big bywords. They're the two areas where we haven't had a lot of focus. There's been a lot of focus on personal data. There's been a lot of focus uh, on consumer protection in terms of not selling them duff devices. But it's trust and resilience which will have the biggest impact on society as a well. whole. And then in terms of how the legislation works, there's a lot of innovation happening. IoT is 20 years old. It's 1998, I believe, the term was first carried. So it's more than 20 years old. But it's still innovating really fast. So any legislation really has to focus on what needs to be achieved rather than how it should be done, because today's technical solutions uh, will not be the same as tomorrow's. So some flexibility is needed. And, and what's happened with WP29 and automotive is a, is a really good start here. So with that, I'll pause for breath. I hope that was interesting. Thank you for, for listening. And, and I think we're going to open it up to questions. 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hayton. That was really interesting to hear. And um, I'm going to be looking for questions in the question box. But in the meantime, maybe I'll start the discussion with you. Um, you know, the first thing I want to know is, you know, you said that actually for um, governments and regulators, you know, not to not to focus on like single incidents, but really think of like scale and what kind of uh, security incidents can take place on scale. You know, as a, a layperson, this can sound really intimidating and a little bit scary in terms of where right. IoT uh, you know, where it's headed. So, you know, I wonder if you can tell us, uh, you know, expand on that a little bit, because I'm sure it's not all doom and gloom, though we have to obviously always um, anticipate the risks and then, um, you know, come up with thoughtful regulation. Sure. I mean, it's sort of like back to my first slide. We're doing this for a reason. IoT has got huge, huge benefits. So we could just turn it all off and walk away. But there are huge opportunities for using IoT for many, many more things. It's just important to think about what could go wrong and make sure that we limit those implications. So generally speaking, for, for legislators, you know, when people built the first IoT devices, they didn't think about security at all. It just wasn't a concern. And we got, we all have read in the newspaper about things like baby monitors where anybody could could you know could 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 listen in and, and watch your baby. And, and people were rightly you know put off by that. I think we've moved a bit beyond that now, um, but a lot of the focus is still on that consumer protection. So I think the legislation, it doesn't mean that this is bad legislation or shouldn't be happening, but it is the much bigger things which can have an impact. Um, and, and that's why, um, and it's a little bit like this slide. This slide shows a, a picture of a city when the lights are turned off. And that's what, leg, what uh, regulators have got to think about. Now, this doesn't mean it's going to have a big impact and the consumers will even necessarily be aware of it. But behind the scenes, they need to think in terms of what are the implications? What would happen if this IoT went wrong? And for many IoT, the answer is not much, particularly consumer IoT, which is the IoT we see much. If my Alexa's all stop working or Facebook goes down, you know, we all shrug and moan a little bit, but it doesn't have a big impact. When it comes to city lights uh, or power stations or road systems, that's where the legislators you know, need to be involved. You know, I'm going to come back to IoT in a second, but you know uh, what you just said about Facebook going down. It was um, it was really interesting because you know the Facebook uh, set of services went down, and in many countries because uh, they've skipped that whole website portion, and now you know small businesses have gone and they've got uh, shops directly on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, the the impact was actually a little bit unequal uh, depending on the country that you were in, and that also opened up people's eyes a little bit to the kind of economic damage that can happen even when like you know something like a facebook uh, or meta I, I, I think it's really important to realize there is a huge amount of innovation happening in all of these areas and 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 what happens is before we know it the implications of the technology are much greater i mean in, in case of facebook as being a platform for commerce it was it became massive and people really didn't notice yeah it, the same sort of things that I, I i deliberately you know didn't talk about things like cryptocurrency but it is, it's where something goes from being just a niche, not very interesting to suddenly, you know, economies or industries or sections of society are relying on something. And once they rely on it, then really, you know, governments sort of have to have a view. They don't necessarily have to take an impact, you know, do anything about it, but they, they want to be aware of what the implications could be. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I wanted to ask you a question, uh, a slide that you, um, a point that you raised in the presentation, which was about open source. Uh, you know, because a lot of people who like are on, you know, talking about the internet and a lot of the communities, they actually like, really like sort of encourage rejecting a little bit of proprietary software for many reasons. And they, mm. and they really encourage people through open source, but, you know, just to know the security issues. I, I wonder if you can just no. expand a little bit on that uh, point. Sure. So open source is a really good thing. Don't get me wrong. But it's just open source is about free sharing, but it shows the problem. I build a piece of software and I offer it to you to use for free. That's a really good thing. You can now build something and innovate on top of my work without you having to have taken all of that expense yourself. But what's happened in open source is the scale of this is immense. So now if that bit of software that I wrote, that I'm the only one in the world who understands, if somebody finds a problem with it, who's going to fix it? Am I, do I have to fix it? Well, I've moved on. I'm doing something else now. I did that 10 years ago. Or does somebody else have to fix it? And this is the difficulty. 
open source is a great community and, and it really is a community. There are many, many people who are fixing other people's code and solving these problems. But there are also, it causes a lot of problems just because of it, of the sheer rate of change. Uh, a big recent vulnerability was called the log4j vulnerability. And that was somebody built a system that was used in many, many different websites around the world. And then for their own purposes, they added some capabilities and they added some capabilities and they added some capabilities. And in the end, it wasn't very secure. Now, it may well have done what they needed it to do, but thousands of people around the world were now using this software. And when a vulnerability was found, they were all exposed to that vulnerability. And we can all point fingers and say, whose fault was it? But the fact is we got that software for free. We used it for free. And the problem with free software is you, you have to pay, you have to support it yourself. Nobody is going to do it for you. So, you know, the, the old adage is never a free lunch. Open source is, is close to a free lunch in some ways. But sometimes if you get indigestion, you've got no one to complain to either. Yeah, you took the adage out of my mouth because that's what I was going to say right now. <laughs> I, I guess I'll wrap up with just, um, we don't, um, oh, there's a new question. Let me ask that. Um, the question says, um, thanks, Dr. Hayton. For achieving trust besides regulation, isn't it important to inculcate literacy and empowerment to the public? What framework would orient and sensitize users countrywide and worldwide? Oh, that, that's a big question. And I'm not sure I'm, I, can, I can answer much of it. But when I'm talking about trust, I'm thinking from the bottom up in terms of the technical side. So in terms of if I receive a computer message, and by I, I mean a computer receives a message from another computer which purports to be your, your webcam or your electricity meter, how do I know whether that is genuine or not? So the, the, the technology can allow those computers to recognize each other and say, yes, I can trust that this message came from that device. This is computer to computer trust. Now, I think that's required to then get individuals to trust the systems, but it's not enough. It's it, the education piece, you know, when it gets to individuals, you know, do you trust Facebook? It's a very complicated question. Um, but if the technology is not sound, if you don't even know that it's Facebook you're talking to, you absolutely can't trust it. So what happened in the internet many years ago and again, getting a little bit technical, is a, a system called SSL, Secure Socket Layer, was invented, which moved the internet from being where you would connect to a website and you wouldn't know what it was. So you would use it for information. You would use it for browsing. This was very, very early days in the 90s. But you couldn't use it for commerce. You couldn't buy or sell anything because you couldn't trust who you were talking to. When SSL came along, you started being able to tell which website you were going to. And that allowed commerce to start. So in the web, we've adopted commerce. We're used to seeing those little padlocks on the web browsers. And we know that I need that to be able to trust something. It doesn't mean it's enough, but it's a first basis. IoT needs to do the same thing. And, and there are IoT devices today which are secure, but there are many, many which are not. So it's, it's getting that basis. It's that technical trust, which is the first step towards getting human trust as well. Um, thank you. There's another question which says the IOTs are just now in the initial stage of induction. Therefore, as and when there is the deepening of its uses, the regulation may evolve with the standardization of protocols. Is that correct? Is that right? Yeah. It, it is true, but the term IOT was founded uh, in 1998. It's been around for a while. And I think most of us don't realize how much IOT there is. Um, there, is, there is an awful lot of it. Um, most cars, most modern cars, have two to 300 different computers inside them. Um, now, they are at one end. We can all count the number of devices on our Wi-Fi networks and think of those. But there are many other devices. There are IoT devices inside every light bulb in a city, in many cities, uh, inside traffic sensors inside concrete to measure how slowly, how, how quickly it sets. There are today hundreds of billions of IoT devices around the world. So yes, it's got a long way to go, but it, it is a long way from just started as well. 
Well, I think that's a good note to end the session on. Uh, Dr. Hayden, on behalf of the IIC, I would like to thank you for this lecture. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be posted up, so I think a lot more people will be able to see it um, over the course of the weekend as well. So thank you so much for giving it. It had a lot of detail. I learned a couple of things that uh, maybe I hadn't considered. So um, so that's been great. And uh, yeah, and uh, thank you so much for joining us and giving no us. No problem. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.